All right. Let's go. <laughs> that's that's all right, I suppose. Uh, I feel like only people who are who kind of filled in the the form are going to get the invitation, right? right? Yeah, I sent it to Joey because he asked for the invitation. All right. I mean, he's a member, exactly. and we know that, so. <laughs> I did. I saw that he showed him the hustle. He dragged it back from Summertown. He brought it down last day. Or was it an enduring Halloween? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the most huge object. Oh, the right. on his head. Uh, he put it on his head. At the back, yeah. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Haven't seen that. <laughs> what a picture. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you didn't, <laughs> but there is still some about it. <laughs> oh, it seems that I can pause. Um, all right, so. Welcome everyone to the fifth talk of this term held by Oxford Archaeological Society. Uh, it really seems that we've pleased and attracted uh, many people by the choice of our guest speaker for today's event, as there is unusually high number of people joining us remotely and here in person as well, which is really brilliant. We, we love to see that. Um, and uh, our today's guest speaker, as all of you already know, uh, is Professor Jan Hodder. And I, I really had prepared a kind of introduction for, for Professor Hodder. But as I found out during this uh, introductory talk, like most of the things I have written down are completely incorrect. So he's not Professor of uh, Anthropology at Stanford University anymore. It's uh, in Istanbul, can you remind me what was the name of the university? Koch University. Koch University, all right. And and he's not any more director of Chattel York Archaeological Project that ended in 2018. Uh, he's still uh, consulting and, and associated with the with the leaders of the project. So uh, as we all know, he's also a pioneer of post processualist uh, theory and uh, famous for uh, these kind of non-positivistic uh, methods applied to uh, interpretation of Chattal Huyuk as a, as a site, which I believe we will hear more about during this talk. So without any further delay, uh, I'm leaving this uh, virtual stage uh, to you, Professor Hodder. Thank you very much, Jakob, and uh, I am very grateful. I just wish I could be there with you in Oxford. Uh, as I was saying to, to, is it Jakob? Is that how you say your name? Yes, yes. Yes. Um, as I was saying to Jakob, I, um, I grew up in Oxford and went to school in Oxford and, uh, and have been back often. And so it's a, very, a place very close to my heart. And I, I, I wish that um, we weren't in this in remote uh, situation. Uh, anyway, let, let me share my uh, screen. And um, I, I should say at the beginning that I'm not entirely uh, sure um, how relevant this question is to you uh, in, in England. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I have been teaching for some time and I'm still emeritus at Stanford. And, and in, 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 the, in the United States, the question of decolonizing uh, has has become the major issue, not only in archaeology but also in very much in anthropology. Huge debates in anthropology about how can we decolonize anthropology, but also in most of the other social sciences at least. Um, so it it is the main buzzword. It's the main issue at the moment. How can you decolonize archaeology and anthropology? 
And uh, so I wanted to use my experience at Chattahoyuk to try and throw uh, some light um, from my perspective on this question. And, and I guess I have come to worry that it, it may not be possible to decolonize archaeology or to decolonize Chattahoyuk. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, so I want to try and express to you where these worries come from and, and where, I, where my thinking is about it at the, at the moment. Um, so, in a way, my chance to decolonize Chattelhuyuk is over. As Jakob says, I, I stopped excavating uh, there, and the project ended in 2018 after 25 years of work there. Um, and I tried during that period to decolonize, but um, let, let's go into the talk and, and see what, what I managed to do and what I didn't manage to do and what um, what I see as the issues uh, today. So Chattelhuyuk, I, I'm just going to give you some very, very, I'm not going to talk about the site very much. Uh, I don't have time to do that. Um, but just just to sort of summarize, the, the site is, is um, uh, dated from about 7,000 to 6,000 BC. Um, and it consists of a large mound, the Chadalio East Mound, uh, which was inha inhabited by about five to 8,000 people. And, and, the, and the site became very famous through the excavations of James Mellart. You can see some of the results of his work on this slide. James Mellart worked in the early 1960s. Um, and he made the site very famous through his publications, and it became a sort of world famous uh, site at that time. The site was then closed because James Mellock got involved in a series of scandals uh, that partly related to Chattelhuyuk itself, uh, including problems uh, of the disappearance of artifacts and the copying of artifacts and the manufacture of, of data. Um, but also he was involved in, in scandals at other sites. Uh, for example, lots of figurines that um, appeared on the market from a site he excavated called Hajala. Uh, and, um, and, and the most famous example is a, a treasure called the Dorak treasure, which he claimed to have seen and published, uh, but then seemed to disappear. Uh, and um, people don't know whether he invented it or stole it or what, whatever happened to it. Um, but as a result of that, the Turks were understandably very angry and they closed, closed the site. So that this is, in, in, if you like, the first example of uh, a colonial in, in, in intervention um, that, that had very negative, uh, well, positive, but also very negative uh, aspects. James Mellor, uh, although his name sounds Dutch, was, was English and Scottish and uh, as well as having a Dutch ancestry. And, and he was very much supported by the British Institute at Ankara. So it was a British affair, if you like. And the, the, the main negative impact of that, uh, the abrupt closing of the project in 1965, meant that there were for, for uh, 25, 30 years, uh, the site was abandoned. There was appalling erosion. The, the site is full of paintings and uh, sculptures and figurines and so on. Uh, that were all the ma large amounts of which were lost, as you can see, his ter terrible erosion and loss of um, uh, archaeological information. And and so, what one of the the aims of uh, getting me to come back and start work in 1993 at Chattahoyuk was, in a sense, a decolonizing, or or rather, an apologizing uh, and trying to set right uh, what had what had happened before. Uh, again, under the heading of the British Institute, because I was at the time teaching at Cambridge. Um, and the main, you know, task that I was set by the Turks was to create an infrastructure to sort of clean up the site uh, and to make it something that could be, uh, that they could be proud of. Uh, and so creating infrastructure was, was a key aspect of that. And, and we, we did other things like that. We actually only excavated in two parts of this enormous 
uh, site is about 13 and a half hectares. Um, the, the, um, the, the two shelters, one in the north area here where uh, we created a space so that the buildings could be left open year round so people, tourists could visit year round uh, and the site could be protected. Uh, and also in the, in the southern area where Mellart had worked, we tried to clean that up and uh, that's the view at the top and then the view at the bottom is our excavations continuing in the deep sanding. The, the mound is about 21 metres high, so it, it has a, a lot of stratigraphy to, to work on. So that was in a sense uh, an attempt to apologise for, for a colonial intervention. Um, and, and there's a broader context of this, of course, which is that Turkey has been the subject of, of uh, looting and um, appropriation by Western powers uh, over centuries. And um, many of the big museums in New York or London uh, are, have artifacts that have been obtained um, from uh, Turkey. And the Turks feel that much of this was obtained Ill illegally and they've been trying to get it back. And so in that larger context, uh, the work that what Mellart did uh, had a particular, um, uh, particular meaning. So th 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 this intervention that we made was supposed to be a positive one. In many ways, it, I think it is, but it also had its negative legacy. Uh, and in particular, it turned out that these shelters are extremely difficult to manage and uh, they created environments uh, that are very difficult to work in and, are, and often very difficult to even go in because the temperatures get very high. And so although this was done with you know, scientific knowledge and the best intentions, we, we have left a legacy of a problem, which is these two shelters that need to be adjusted and changed and renewed and so on at, at, an, at enormous cost. Uh, and so we have created, again, a, a sort of negative legacy through our colonial endeavours. But what I would mainly want to focus on is um, the, uh, the, the local community. And um, I, I want to do this because most of the discussion about decolonizing archaeology is about community-based participatory research, about the idea of engaging communities uh, in in, in the archaeological process. And we have always seen that as a very important part of the work we do at Chattal, and I'll talk a bit about that later. But training uh, people, educating people, involving them in the process, involving them in the scientific work, uh, all, all of that has been a key cornerstone of, of the work that we've done at Chattal Hoyuk, and was right from the, from the beginning. And you can see some examples here of people being trained uh, to do conservation uh, in particular, uh, since we're only there two to three months of the year, uh, the site often erodes and has problems during the rest of the year. And it's important to have um, sci local scientists and local people who can, can work on, on the conservation of the site while we're, while we're away. But, but the local community is just one of the many stakeholders uh, I've, I, in fact, was never able to get all of the stakeholders around a heritage table. So this is just a notional idea here. Uh, but um, the, 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 this does list some of the main players in, in, in our project at Chattahoyu. And I guess the, one of my main points that I want to make is that it's very difficult to separate local community engagement from all of these other stakeholders, that in fact, the local communities are the most powerless in these groups, and they often lose out when these other players try and intervene and try and engage, even though they have the best intentions. So I'm going to try and look at some of these other, other groups and show how, how their involvement has um, had a negative impact on the local community. And I want to start with the archaeologists themselves. So when I, when I started in 93 at Chattahoyu, um, we had a fairly small team, as you can see at the top. But over the years going down these pictures, the, the, the project has expanded until there's uh, well over 150 people involved in the project. Um, some students, but mostly researchers and specialists and contract people 
of various sorts. And, uh, and one of the impacts of that is that the, 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 um, the local community has got rather swamped by this in, in, in a huge influx uh, of, of foreigners during the, um, during the um, summer season. These are people from about 25 different countries globally. And as we worked over the 25 years, there, there was a major shift in um, uh, our recording and uh, excavating um, techniques. So what we started off in the early 90s, still working largely on paper. Uh, but as, we, as time went on, we, we became digital. And, and um, by the end, we were completely paperless and all recording was done uh, on these tablets, or recording and planning was done on the tablets, uh, and uh, this allowed us to you know, do trendy things like like this, uh, and also, and I'll come back to talking about this later. So it became very high tech, and one of the, um, I mean, it's a, that's a wonderful you know reflexive method in a way because this person here, uh, as she is digging has access to the whole database and all, all, all information about Chattel Huya that she, she can interact with and compare and so on and so forth. So it's a wonderful uh, process, but it involves a level of uh, skill that is very high. Most of the people from the local villages around Chattel Huya uh, leave school after, uh, at the primary level and are very uneducated and, and don't speak English and, and are not terribly uh, able to deal with computers and so on. And, and wh whereas our system is based on ArcGIS and, uh, and access databases and so on. Uh, and it, and it's becomes, it became very, very difficult to use. And so um, the, the, the process itself increasingly excluded uh, the local community. It became more and more difficult for them to participate, participate and to, to express their views about what was going on uh, because the expression had, was, had all become digital. And th this is some interesting work done by Alison Mickle, which has been published, uh, where, where what she's doing is doing a network analysis of our publications, including our you know, unit sheets and context sheets. And um, uh, so not publications, but everything that we write digitally. Um, she, she has taken all that data and uh, looked at the connections between them. So for example, the connections between uh, people who are referred to uh, in the unit sheets and the context sheets and the, and the um, archive reports and the publications and so on. And what you see is that there's a dense cloud of people who are very, very integrated in the, uh, in the center of these clouds uh, here. But then there are all these sort of peripheral people and she, she did an analysis of this and showed that it's the peripheral people that is largely the local community, that they, that they just become, they became excluded from the, the archaeological process because of these technical issues. So that's one set of processes that um, uh, has, has not gone in a deco decolonizing direction, despite, this, despite our attempts to uh, work with the community and to engage them, um, the, the end result has been rather disappointing. Another important uh, player, of course, is the Turkish state, the Turkish government, um, who, who provide permits for us. And there is a government representative on site all the time. And everything that we do on site is very carefully regulated and controlled. And the, the Turkish state um, is doing this as part of a, of a process of um, wanting to have an international recognition for Chattel Huyu. And you can see that, for example, on this World Expo 2010 uh, pavilion at Shanghai, the Turkish pavilion, which is uh, designed, uh, this, this, this um, design here on the pavilion is, is a copy, if you like, schematic copy of the one of the most famous paintings at Chattel Huyuk, which supposedly shows uh, Chattel Huyuk 
a town here, lots of little houses, and then an exploding volcano over the top. And that, but the, the best indication of the way the state uses Chapel Hill for its own interests uh, is the fact that in 2012, uh, they lobbied to get Chapel Hill placed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. And so that happened at, in St. Petersburg in 2012. And in many ways, you, you might have thought that this process of you know, putting Chattel Hiuk on the UNESCO World Heritage List was a positive thing for the local community uh, in the sense that there were guidelines uh, in the um, nomination process which insisted that the local voices were heard and were, were, part, of the, um, were part of the nomination dossier that was, was, was put forward. But uh, Helen Human has, did a PhD about this process and she showed very convincingly that although on paper there was consultation, in fact, um, it, it was very notional. And in, in many, many ways, the local community's voices were not heard. They, they were not, not invited to all the main meetings. They were, not, they were not involved in the advisory process. Their views were not really um, asked for or heard. Uh, in fact, they were very, very specifically excluded from the whole process. And uh, so she, she, she has shown, Helen Human has shown very, very clearly that, that the, the, this UNESCO process can be very negative in terms of the involvement of the, of the community. And, and, and the, 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 the placing it on the heritage list was very much in the interests of the national government, not in, not in the, not, not, it was not designed to be in the interest of the local community. Nevertheless, placing it on uh, the, the world uh, heritage list did mean that there was a lot of publicity for a while. And uh, again, this is very much the, the state using Chattahoyuk in order to promote its own uh, in, international uh, credibility, you know, be, becoming a modern state by having more sites on the heritage list than China, for example, that, well, that was their aim. And here you can see uh, the, Minister of, uh, uh, the Minister of Culture, who's two people to my right walking in here, um, bringing a lot of uh, press to the site. Uh, but this sort of thing just skates over. You know, you have this sort of sudden in, in, in influx of people and interest, but it has no sustained impact on the, on the local community. It, it did not lead to a su substantial increase in tourism. And you can say the same about much of the other uh, global interest in, in Chattahoyu. Chattahoyu, we, we've often had sort of famous uh, visitors who come to come to the site. Um, I, I, can, I, can, I don't know whether any of you, I, I, don't, I don't know whether people still watch Blue Peter or not, <laughs> and, and, I, and, and whether you're young enough or old enough, to, young enough, I suppose, to have, um, to have seen these people. But anyway, that's part of the Blue Peter. The, the person that, that I most was pleased to meet was uh, Ian Thorpe, who was a um, Australian multi-Olympic gold medal winner swimmer, uh, and it was great to, to meet him. But but the, the, this, you know, again, you get sort of flashes of um, flashes of publicity, but all the various interest groups, the sponsors, and the, the, the Turkish state, uh, and um, inter the BBC, and you know, international bodies of various sorts that are involved in this, uh, that they, they're not really interested in contributing in any way to the local community. They just want to use the site. It's very ex extractive. They're trying to extract stuff that will amuse or titillate or um, excite people on, on, the, on the global, uh, globally. But it has very little positive impact. You might have thought it would increase tourism, but our, we've done a lot of studies of um, the numbers of tourists visiting Chattel over time. And these sorts of events don't really have much impact. But there are, um, you know, positive things that come out of the sort of uh, global interests. The, 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 the Chattel Huyg is a difficult site to understand when you visit it. And so there's been a lot of uh, attempt by uh, universities, uh, specialists, um, tech specialists from around the world, tech companies and so on, 
in, in showing that they can use virtual reality to reconstruct uh, Chattel Huyu. And this is all part of you know, trying to make the site more accessible to a wider audience and, it, and it's very engaging and, and so on. Um, but uh, again, th this is very remote from, from communities who, who don't have the technology. Um, we bought the first computers that were, that were available to the local school in, in the local village. Uh, and, and on the whole, people don't have access to this type of um, technology to run these things and to, to see them. And this is even more true of some of the work that has been done uh, on um, immersive uh, virtual environments. Uh, th this is work done in Duke University, <clears throat> where you, you can sort of go into these cubes and uh, uh, wear glasses to see a house at Chattel Huyu. Uh, and then you can click on click. You see that guy holding a clicker, uh, and he can click on the walls and, and link into the Shadowview database and find information about the project. So you so you can live in and look at and explore the data for Shadowview in these virtual environments. Um, but um, again, you know, this this doesn't happen at, at uh, in in the in central Turkey in the Konya Plain where Shadowview is located. And my final example of this is uh, an artist uh, who, who is Turkish, Rafik Anadol, but lives and works in Los Angeles, um, and who used the Chattelhuyuk database, the Chattelhuyuk database, which is five terabytes of data. He used that to create art from, and uh, and it's absolutely beautiful and mind-boggling art. Uh, he, he sort of uses the connections in the database to create these sort of networks and so on. Uh, uh, it's called the curious case of Chattelhuyuk. If you're interested in it, it's online. You can look at it, um, and um, just mind-boggling stuff. But but and, and we did bring some of the people from the the Konya Plain, some of the villagers and so on, to, to look at this and participate in it. Um, but I but I, I I felt it didn't really connect, uh, and it certainly didn't do anybody any good in terms of. Um, uh, enhancing conditions for the, for the people in the local community. So another, a, another community, another stakeholder, if you like, at Chattelhuyuk, where similar things have happened, um, are, are those that uh, are brought to Chattelhuyuk by uh, images of uh, women. And um, in particular, there has long been the idea that Chattelhuyuk is the source of uh, the mother goddess, that the first real mother goddesses are, are found at Chattelhuyuk. Uh, and this, this was an idea that Mellart supported. And we have found um, these absolutely wonderful images, uh, statuettes of, uh, of women. Um, although, in fact, um, while in this particular context, it seems very likely that these are women, gen the genitalia are not shown. So it could be the case that these are sort of sumo type wrestlers, but um, and, and are male. But um, but anyway, the, um, the the notion that Chattelhuyuk is is a source of the goddess uh, has has meant that we've had large numbers of people from the goddess community, mainly from California, but also from um, Germany and Britain and from Istanbul, you know, from different parts of the world, very much a global community that, that has, uh, so they bring busloads of people to Chattelhuyuk uh, as part of goddess tours of uh, Turkey. And uh, what this has led me into sort of strange um, experiences. Here I am on a fashion show catwalk in Istanbul, uh, where Baha Korchan, who is part of the, the goddess movement, she um, created a line of clothes uh, that were based on Chattelhuyu, rather some, somewhat loosely based on Chattelhuyu, but nevertheless, um, and this is a, um, it was very much a global event. And this is a Japanese uh, uh, magazine article showing these um, six foot five models in these supposedly Chattelhuyu clothes, uh, all sort of modeling these sort of small fat dumpy Mother goddess uh, images from from Chattelhuyu, and um, I, I, you know, I felt that we should support this type of uh, 
engagement with Chadrahu, that they had a, a right to be participating in, and involved. And we've had, we had lots of seminars and engagements with the goddess community uh, to try and relate their ideas about the goddess to our own archaeological evidence. <laughs> um, but it, again, is something that's very disconnected from the local community, or, although the goddess community tried to do their best. So what they, from, from their point of view, what, what they, what some of them did anyway, uh, was to, um, in the 90s and, and, and the early 2000s, was to build a, a, a women's center at, uh, in the local village, which is called Kuchiko, in a small village. Um, and in that uh, women's center, they you know, played guitar and did uh, circle dances and try, try to introduce the local women uh, to Western ideas um, about the role of women. Uh, and um, this, this, of course, very much upset uh, the more traditional components in the village. The Chadalhuyuk is located in, a, in the Konya Plain, which is in central Turkey, uh, in, a, in a social environment, which is very traditional, um, low levels of education, uh, and very, very um, religious, very Islamic in, 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 in all aspects of life. All, all the women are covered and um, women are not really supposed to say very much in public and not to have jobs and things. And so it's a very much a sort of constrained uh, environment for women. And so uh, the, the, the village reacted by burning down uh, the, the, the women's center. The, the, the actual culprits were, were, never, were never found. I, I don't know whether the police made much of an effort but um, and so I don't really know what happened, um, but but it but it um, it appeared to be a case where the local village reacted by by burning down and excluding uh, and getting rid of uh, these uh, new age feminists from from California. <clears throat> but let's get then back to the village uh, itself and to the local community and see how they've responded to all this, <clears throat> to all these different stakeholders who have all come in to extract from them and to, uh, and to, um, to give to Chattelhuyuk in their own way, but then creating harm in various ways. So what, one thing to say immediately is that it's not at all clear what the local community is. Uh, when when Merlart arrived and when we started, uh, excavating, it was clear that there was no natural community. There, there was no group of people who were interested in Chattelhuyu. They didn't know anything about Chattelhuyu. They didn't know what it was. They didn't even recognize it as an archaeological site. It was just a man where they collected herbs. And so there, there was no group of people who were interested in or had any association with Chattelhuyu. And the site, the site is surrounded by a large number of small villages that dot the landscape. And about 11 kilometers away, there's a largest town called Chumra. And about uh, 45 kilometers away, there's a big city, big city called Konya. And uh, all of these at various times claim, you know, in some sense ownership, but there was no natural, no natural community that was there. So when, when we arrived, um, uh, I needed to employ people, to employ quite a large number of people. And uh, it became clear that we were not supposed to employ women. Um, and I, I've, I've, and we can maybe talk about this later, but I, I felt unhappy about that. And um, uh, so I insisted that we do employ women. And then the men in the village say, okay, you can, you can employ some of them, the married ones, but you can't pay them. You have to pay, pay us. And again, I, I demurred and insisted. And so in the end, we did pay the women uh, uh, and gave the money to them. Although um, 
my anecdotal evidence is that they would then hand the money over normally uh, to their to the men male members of the families. But anyway, that that's a clear example of I I felt something was wrong and uh, and in a colonial way I created a change, um, and that and that paying that inflow of money into the village the local villages has had a lot of impact. Some of, some of these women have started their own companies, the ones that, who were divorced or marginalized, um, uh, because we did manage to, to, to employ people who were not married, um, uh, to include them in the workforce. So, um, you know, they started their own businesses and we, we saw changes with women taking their scarves off and be, becoming you know, much more westernized through through their engagement with Chattel Hill. So we're creating change, un undoubtedly. We try to involve um, the local community in all our decision-making processes about what should happen on the site. Should we build shelters? Should it be a World Heritage Site? These sorts of things. Now that was very difficult because the men and the women refused to be in the same room as each other. So here we have a meeting with the women uh, and um, uh, the, the, one of the problems was that the women have complete, had completely different ideas about what should happen at Chattahoyo from the men. And so we never really managed to get any sort of consensus from the community. And on, on, on the whole, one, one could say that one of the impacts of our presence was that we not only created a community, so we created the people who were interested in at Chattahoyo or involved in Chattahoyo, but we also created divisions uh, but, uh, in many ways between men and women and between the different villages and you know which, which one wanted to benefit from Chattahoyuk and, and the, the local town wanted to control everything and the local city wanted to control everything. So in many ways we created division uh, by asking for uh, involvement and engagement from the local community, different communities one should say. We involved in a whole series of large-scale educational programs. Thousands of children came to the site over the 25 years um, to, to learn about excavation, to learn about Chattahoyuk, and to, 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 to learn about how to recognize sites and why they were important, and, and to try and combat the large amount of looting that, that goes on in the local landscape on these mounds. Well, one of the sort of, you could say, success stories uh, through this community engagement was that the local guard there, one, one of the guards at the site called Sardredin, um, uh, who left school at 11 and had never used a computer, uh, wrote uh, his own book about Chattahoyuk. Um, in fact, he's now written two books. And when he, he first wrote this book, he, he um, we, we, taught him how to, to write. Uh, um, I mean, he knew how to write, but how to use a computer. He couldn't understand why the, the, the letters on the keyboard are all jumbled up in this sort of strange way. But he ended up managing to, to write 50,000 words, but literally 50,000 words in a long line without any full stops or commas or capital letters or paragraphs, just 50,000 words in a long sequence. And we, we um, helped him to edit it and translated it into English and it was published in, in the United States. And indeed has been very well reviewed. It was reviewed by the American anthropologist, for example, uh, and it had much better reviews than any book that I have ever written. So um, in, in many ways, that was a success story, although he never got mon much money from it, right? neither from that book or from uh, this other book that he, he wrote. And, and in many ways, he's a sad figure that ended up in jail and um, uh, and has had all sorts of problems. But anyway, it, uh, it, it, I think he's very proud of these books and the, and the fact that he does manage to sell them uh, at um, at the site itself in, in a little cafe that he built there. So the main work that we have done has, has been um, very much under the heading of community-based participatory research. <coughs> uh, at the top left, you see uh, ethnography being conducted by Ayfe Batu, who's a Turkish anthropologist, 
trained at Berkeley in California. <clears throat> and she, um, she worked with the local community and tried to act as a sort of bridge between the project to help us understand the impact of what we were doing and to sort of work with the community and us in terms of finding solutions that were more beneficial and less extractive uh, than the examples that I've given. One of the things that she discovered uh, was that, uh, as I said before, that the local community didn't really have any natural connection to Chattelhoo. They didn't know about the site uh, and uh, knew very little about um, the early uh, history of, of, of the region. And so one of the main functions that Sonia Atalai, uh, who's, who's one of the main promoters of the idea of community-based participatory research, one of the main um, aims of Sonia's work when she came to Chattelhoo was, was, was to um, create community uh, around Chattelhoo by educating. And they used a whole series of different uh, techniques like um, uh, theater and feast day events and so on and so forth. I mean, a whole range of things, including uh, um, uh, making comics uh, for young people uh, in the region for them to understand what is Chattelhoo. So, so that she became involved in a very major um, attempt to educate and to, to, to involve and to engage uh, the local community. And, and in many ways, you could argue that that was very successful, but the fact that we um, have been working there for 25 years has also allowed us to, to evaluate a lot of these programs and see whether they've had any real uh, impact. And uh, although we can say, yes, you know, thousands of children came and were involved in um, these educational programs, for example, um, when, when we did um, uh, follow-ups, you know, went, went back 10 years later and talked to these who had been children uh, in these projects, we found that their attitudes were no different really from the general population. There's no real evidence that it had some sort of long-term impact, which has been very uh, disappointing. But perhaps the most disappointing has been a process that has really led to the end of any community-based work at Chattelhoo. And this came about in a number of ways, but as an, ex an example, an example here, what's going on is that in the visitor center at Chattelhoo, some young and un unmarried women uh, are learning uh, how to make kilims. Uh, so kilim is a type of carpet uh, that is still made in Turkey, but it used to be a village craft and people used to gain you know, income from, women used to gain income from making kilims. And the idea was for them to make kilims based on Chattelhoo designs. And they did do this, copying Chattelhoo designs. And the idea was that well, they could then sell these at a higher price because they had been um, verified as Chattelhoo designs uh, by, by the Chattelhoo team. So it was an example of an attempt at sort of working together to create, to create um, change and uh, in a positive direction. Um, however, this, this was brought to an end uh, by the elders in the, in the village, uh, who, the, or of course men, who, who, um, who felt that, it, that, that they felt uncomfortable that uh, these young women were working um, as part of a, an international team with, and that they were being introduced to values and things that were rather alien or rather different from, from their own. And th this, this um, information about stopping this uh, went, went up to Ankara and to the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. And uh, they decided to uh, stop all um, community work. We were not allowed to go into the village or talk to people in the local community, do any work in the local community of any sort in the last three years of, of the project. And so this is an, an example where, you know, something which is entirely well-meaning, you know, Sonia Atalai and other people working on that part of the project 
were entirely well-meaning in terms of trying to empower and engage and to involve, uh, to, to create participation amongst the community, entirely well-meaning, uh, led to uh, a negative outcome. And th this has to be understood within the context of the politics of Turkey, where, where I'm sure you're all aware Turkey has moved away from uh, the notion of a democratic secular state towards an authoritarian, very highly nationalistic and, uh, uh, and non-secular state so that increasingly re religious issues are, are being brought into what was a, you know, a, the Ataturk type of Republican uh, model. And within that context, uh, there's been increasingly attempts to stop uh, all foreign excavations in Turkey, uh, not, not directly, but by indirectly making it very difficult to do research in Turkey as, as an archeologist. Um, and certainly stopping community-based work of the type that we were doing. I, I, the, the story is slightly more complicated than that, and, I, and I'm happy to talk about it later. But um, uh, I, um, th this experience um, s led me to doubt and question um, what we had been doing. And, uh, and some of the very basic ideas that we had been using and, and led me to question the whole question of decolonizing. And I, so I, I have found it very difficult to, to come up with a conclusion to this talk um, because I, 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 the situation is so complex and, and, I, and, I, um, and I'm not sure how far I want to, to, push, uh, to push the argument. But I, but I do think that global inequalities make decolonizing difficult. And I hope I've shown that, that, um, that the, um, the, that the local community often tends, tends to lose out. Um, we obviously live in a very globally connected world, but it's a very unequal one. And so, all of those other stakeholders, you know, even the, the, it depends what you mean by the local community, but the, 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 certainly the town of Konya, the, the, you know, the state of, of, um, of Turkey based in Ankara, uh, the Istanbulites, um, all of these tend to want to use and extract from uh, Çatalhöyük and from, in effect, then the local community for their own sets of interests. The sponsors, all of them have their own sets of interests. UNESCO has its own sets of interests. The British Institute has its own interests. Um, the, the goddess community, all, all these different uh, communities, even though they have the best of intentions in terms of the local community, in fact, make the situation often make it worse and, uh, and end up being very extractive. Clearly in that context, it's right to say that we should try to support local communities and to empower them because they're so disempowered in this global network. But I guess my one conclusion is that it's much harder to do that than I had imagined because of the power and the pervasive influence of these global inequalities. But beyond that, I've also it's led me to think that um, many of the ideas that we take for granted are themselves not helpful in, in any sort of decolonizing process, that they are themselves colonizing. Uh, the ideas, that the, the terms that we take for granted. So archeology span is itself, of course, a Western notion um, that when we take around the world, uh, we introduce uh, to other cultures and other traditions. The whole idea of community archaeology emerged uh, in, in the West. And one of the things that we did at Chata was to create a community that didn't exist. You know, there wasn't a Chattahuyo community. Uh, and so we have produced one uh, in, our, in an image that we, that we had and we brought with us. I haven't talked very much about indigenous, but again, there are many what you might think indigenous groups around the world 
including the Kurds in, in, uh, in Southeast Turkey, who would deny the notion of the indigenous. They see the, they see the indigenous as a, as a negative term. It's a term that makes a lot of sense in the United States, but whether it makes sense in other parts of the world, it's not always clear. I haven't mentioned the example of reburial, but that, that's a really good example where um, I've come across a number of cases recently where because of the experience of reburying in, um, uh, in, in relation to Native American communities and uh, and I guess uh, Australian Aboriginal communities. Um, the, the, there's an, a sensitivity that we impose on other countries. So I came across this recently in Brazil where um, uh, people from California were saying, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't study these remains, they should be reburied. When, where, but the Brazilians themselves were completely uninterested in this question. And that, that's our experience at Chatelhuyu. So we, as we were working, we realized that there were some very late burials. There were the early Islamic, early Islamic burials on the man. And th this didn't worry anybody in the village or in the town or the community. But the Californian-based archaeologists felt, oh, you know, this is something that we should be concerned about. We should rebury these remains. And um, so with, this was a sensitivity that we were imposing uh, on the community. The word prehistory is another, another example. I mean, we, we take, for example, we don't think about the term prehistory, um, but certainly in the United States, that's become a, a dangerous or abusive word almost. It's a, the, the idea that there are societies that did not have history um, is, is sort of uh, a, very, a very sort of colonial Western um, uh, attitude. Uh, and, and of course, um, it, 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 one can say that it's just based on the idea uh, that there are societies with and without text, but that itself privileges the privileges text. Why, why should we identify text as being, you know, the, the key way of dif differentiating different types of society? And, and to say that societies without texts are prehistoric, which is, is nonsense. I mean, clearly, pre-text societies had history. Uh, and so um, it, it is in some way a, a, an abusive term. And, and in, in um, at Chatal, we have a slightly different version of this, which is that in those comics and things that we were producing, we used the term prehistory, but the local imams uh, re reacted against that very strongly and, and said that you know, they, they knew the history of, um, of Turkey uh, through, through the Quran. Uh, and uh, that um, uh, you know, this the idea of evolution and prehistory was not something that we should be promoting and teaching to the children. And then finally, the I, I've mentioned ideas of gender equality that that I just started off thinking, you know, this is obvious that these women should um, uh, be able to earn money and so on. <clears throat> but it's undoubtedly the case that we have. Had a big impact on gender relations in the local villages, and and I guess you have to decide in your own minds whether you think that's right or wrong. But th this, um, in general terms, I've become worried that uh, that, it, that all these things that we take for granted are themselves colonial in nature, uh, and that um, it, it, that to do an archaeology that somehow avoids that is it's just extremely difficult. Uh, I'm not really sure what archaeology would look like if, if one uh, um, tried to do something that uh, accommodated all these concerns. So that's it. Uh, the, these are the um, um, some of the sponsors that, um, that, that all this work is based on. Uh, and uh, I look forward to your uh, questions. Thank you very much for this talk, Jan. It was really um, interesting and at, at the same time a bit depressing to, to really see how harsh this archaeological reality can be 
uh, in the in the real world. But yeah, it's good to to see on this example that sometimes the the ideals we we would love to have and see in the world are not that easily uh, achieved. I would say even when when we are trying to do our best. So. Uh, yeah, for everyone who is joining us remotely, if you would have any question, uh, please don't hesitate to write them down in the chat or raise your hand and uh, yeah, you will be given space to, to ask a question. Uh, uh, until that time, oh, Liana, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Sorry? Yeah. yeah. All right, go go on. You will. Um, can you mute your chat? Yeah. Sorry, that was. <laughs> uh, sorry, a bit of a technical difficulty. Uh, can Can you want to you want to come in and? Just ask the question. <laughs> so, um, you mentioned that you're gonna need to get close to the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Um, so you mentioned a disappointment with how unsuccessful your educational programs were, and that they didn't seem to cause much change in attitudes in the community. Um, but on the flip side. You seemed uncomfortable with how your reaction, your um, interaction with gender equality in the local community changed things, and that seems contradictory to me. I feel like the presence of a different group is going to cause new ideas <coughs> in the interaction community. That's not necessarily inherently um, colonialist, although obviously it can be. So why why do you think it would be acceptable to cause changes in education but not in gender equality? Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure. Um, so you, you're right that I, that I expressed that I'm uncomfortable about the gender inequality issue, but um, I was raising that as a question. Sorry, can you hear me, Liana? Yeah, yeah, yeah she, she, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. No, I'd, I'd like you to come back on it if you'd like, if you'd like to. Um, I. But, but nevertheless, I would do that again. You know, I, I, so what, what I mean is I would, I would educate, I, sorry, I would, I would employ women again if I were doing it over again. Or, or, although I'm questioning, I'm, you know, asking you to question really whether, whether that's the right to do. I, I do feel myself that there are some types of intervention that are justifiable on the basis of universal human rights. And um, so although I'm largely a contextualist, I do believe that there are some things which are universal human rights and that gender equality is one of them. I, I, I find it very difficult to just, justify that, um, but but it's I, I think does one, one does need to take a stand at some point and I, and I feel strongly that I would do that again. Uh, so so I think I think what I'm saying then, Liana, is, is that um, in, in some ways I feel more strongly about the gender issues than I do about other educational issues. I mean I and, and I think that's because the um, you know, teaching people about gender issues is um has has real social impact uh in in a way that telling people that um you know chadwell there was a particular type of shape of pottery you know doesn't have the same sort of social impact um so um yeah but but you know the educational stuff is is again very difficult. It, is is it right to teach people that there is such a thing as evolution? Now, what what does one do when you meet people who deny evolution and and when you meet religious 
groups that deny evolution do, do you do you insist or do you say oh yes that's another point of view anyway i'm not sure i have answers to these questions and, I, and i'm less clear about that one than i am about, than i am about the gender one do you do you want to come back on that liana Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering my question. I'm sorry for technical difficulties on our end. Um, I, I agree that I feel quite strongly about the, the gender question and that it seems like education, educating women seems to be a big deal in changing gender equality. Um, in terms of the question about religious groups, did you make any effort to invite religious groups to, to Chattelhuyuk and have them see the site and have their interpretations as part of it? Um, well, the, the um, <laughs> depends, depends what, so, so if you mean the imams, do, do you mean that? Do you mean that that's a thing? Because we, there are obviously different religious groups that come, but, but, um, uh, I, you're probably, no, I, I, I mean, we, we, um, I certainly met the imam and, we, and the imams came to the sites and we talked to them. But I wouldn't, that, that would be going too far for me, I think. Uh, well, well it's at least at the time it was. I, I, I felt that, that I didn't have the right to try and change their views about evolution. But, but I, if it was just me and them in a room and the rest of the world wasn't there, you know, I would probably have that discussion. But I'm afraid that politics plays a role in there and, and that I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, if I really upset the imams, which of course in the end I did, but if I had really upset the imams right from the beginning, I don't, I don't know to what extent we would have been allowed to work at Chattel at all. So, so I'm afraid it's compromise, compromise, compromise. And um, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to um, let you up and moderate the discussion because I would happily talk about this for hours, but thank you very much. <laughs> Right. Uh, we have some questions in the chat, so I will start with one of those. Uh, don't worry, James. We we see you. You will be given space to, to ask a question. Um, so Emily asked uh, if did you question the fact that you started working on the site to right a colonial wrong, whilst being uh, British yourself? Do you think there would have been an alternative? Could this have been led by a Turkish team? Yeah. Well, it, I mean, over time it became increasingly Turkish. The the um, you know the, the Turks changed the rules, and uh, I, I, we had to have a, a Turkish assistant director, and and um, I. So although I stopped excavating at Çatalhöyük, there are some discussions about my going back to to work in the southeast of Turkey. And um, I'm, I'm very interested in why, why they would want, why the Turks would want another international project. And I think it's because, um, partly because it's about money and expertise. But it's also, you know, like the UNESCO thing, it's very much about wanting to have international recognition. Um, to have an international project that shows the world how important Turkey's heritage is. And so there, there are reasons why the Turks really wanted and want foreign, foreign intervention. Um, but if I do go back, uh, which is not at all, you know, it's not, not at all certain um, or even likely, um, I, I, it, it's clear that now it would be in a very different context, that um, I would just be part of a Turkish project, or rather the British, the British Institute would be part of something that was very, very heavily controlled and run by the Turks. So we would, they would in a sense be using us. And, and, I, and that, that makes me feel slightly more comfortable. Um, when I started at Chatal, I, I was very much in the driving seat. Uh, and um, and 
and that's the way the Turks wanted it to be. When I first started, I was not allowed to have a Turkish co-director. It's really interesting how things have changed. I was not allowed to have um, a Turkish co-director. In fact, the whole, whole idea was that Chattelhuyet was a foreign project. You know, it had to stay foreign. And there are different rules for foreign projects and for local and for indigenous projects. So this is a great question, but that, I guess that's the context within which, um, which, I, which I started work. I, 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 couldn't have, I couldn't have done then what is now possible, which is, as I said, as I said to work within a Turkish framework. Right. Uh, Victoria is then asking a bit similar question about uh, your handover to a uh, Turkish researcher uh, since 2018 and whether this might be a way of like, decol decolonizing Cyrus Chatoruyuk. Sorry, can you say that? I've missed the first part of the question. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's about. Victoria was asking about handover to a Turkish researcher, which started since 2018, right? Uh, yeah. So if you could like talk more about it, and whether you think uh, that it, this is the way how to decolonize Chattel who are more effective. <laughs> For me to leave, yes. <laughs> I, I, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I, I see that a number of your comments and so on are, are saying that I'm being depressing. And um, I, I don't mean to be depressing. I just think it's extremely hard. Um, I, I still think that you know community work and engaging communities is is the right thing to be doing, and that they are the weak link in the chain, if you like. And one should be trying to do that. But I do think that for me to do it in a foreign country, uh, I like Turkey, uh, has become extremely. Difficult, and you're right, Victoria, that what is happening now is is very positive. So, you know, as I said, Turkey, Central Turkey is a very conservative, very anti-secular, very religious, very very AKP, which is Erdogan's party, and he you know, AKP, Erdogan sees himself very much linked to the Central Turkey area, and. Um, the result of this is, is that uh, um, they have always been rather hesitant to give me support. So while, while I got a lot of you know, support from international, international companies and big banks and things based in Istanbul, you know, I was linked into a global network. Uh, the, there was always a sort of hesitancy and a sort of you know, feeling that, so I would often go around to local companies and say, well, would you like to support us? And they would always be very welcoming, but never actually given me any money or a very, very limited amount of support. But since I've left, um, there's been a great influx of funding and support um, to uh, the, the new director who's, who's Turkish. Um, and for example, just this summer, uh, a new visitor center or a proper visitor center is being built there um, uh, with quite a large amount of influx of funding from, I think mainly from Konya itself, from the big city, as well as from the Ministry of Culture. And so I feel that he is able to do things that I can't or couldn't. Uh, and that, 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 you know, that's the way it should be. And, that, and that, that's, you know, so I, I'm very hopeful. But on the other side, you know, I heard recently that he's having problems raising money because um, while he can get local money for local projects like the visitor center to actually do the archeology, span um, it's more difficult to get funding, which is a very often international. And so, you know, maybe that he, he's also in a difficult position um, because of, you know, inability to get access to the international funding. Anyway, it, it's just very compl complicated. But but uh, I, I do feel I do feel that um, the current situation there has more potential for being successful in terms of in terms of working and engaging and involving the communities. All right. Thank you, um, James. Would you like to? Ask you a question. Sure. Um, th thank you very much indeed, Ian, for a, a very 
uh, honest, thoughtful and thought provoking um, lecture. I think many people watching will have had various thoughts and preconceptions challenged by it. And I think that's, I really appreciate and value that. Um, perhaps it's slightly unfortunate that the talk's titled, you know, has the colonialism in the title, because really um, it seemed to me listening to it, the talk was more about um, recognizing the competing interests. I mean, some of which one might class as colonial because it's British people in Turkey, but others of which are different challenges and, and stresses and strains within the society of Turkey itself between people who have different, uh, um, your different stakeholders, for instance, who aren't necessarily colonial in those activities. Uh, and you're, that, you're then faced with a challenge, as you, as you rightly say, of how do you deal with um, conflicting views on doing things. Um, and at some point, um, either people have to lapse into moral relativism and say they do it that way, we do it this way. Or we have to come down with a view that one view is better than the other and try and justify that. So I'm just recognising those complexities. And I think that's very interesting. One, one question I think will be interesting um, for your, your thoughts on um, is that you, you talk about Turkish history, but clearly as a sort of bizarrely a colonial activity, Turks are people who've been in that area for a, a relatively limited period of time. What, how do you think your, or your archaeology or any archaeology in general in, in, in Turkey is affected by views of Turks themselves that what's prior to being Turkish is something which is, is is not of great interest to them, or is it something that, as a society and as local villages, they have a great interest in? How, how what's the, the views on that in Turkish society? Mm. Thank you, James. The the um, j just to come back a little bit on your your discussion of the colonial. In my view, um, the way that Istanbul Turks talk about and engage with Konya is colonial. Um, so, so I, uh, I, I would, um, yeah, I think there are lots of examples where you have internal processes of colonialism, you know, where you have people extracting from and not giving back very much to uh, commu com communities. Um, uh, so, so the, the other part of your question is, is very interesting and, and extremely complex to, I'm, I'm afraid, but, but basically, um, uh, you, you know, uh, under Ataturk, the, the, there was um, an attempt to somehow um, marry uh, the the notion that Turks came from Central Asia with, with the with the notion that you know they, they had always been there, and so one one particular version of that that archaeologists got very involved with. I think it was in the 30s, 40s, was um, the idea of, of a reflux, you know, that, that originally they had, they were in places like Konya, and the Turks then went to Central Asia and then came back again. So that, that was one way of making sense of it. And, and over the years, there have been different ways in which different political groups have used the past. So, um, you know, Ataturk, Ataturk's tomb is, is surrounded by images of Hittites. And so that, that was one, one way that he, he, he could talk about, because one of the problems in Turkey is that it's drenched in Greco-Roman stuff. And so it, it just, and, and so the, there's a need to get beyond that. And, and so one, one idea is to go to the Hittites. Um, the, you know, Erdogan himself has very often touted the Ottomans as a sort of, origin story for his view of Turkey. Uh, and there are some, and I've been thinking, I've been wondering recently, and somebody, somebody said this to me recently, that the new project, this international project that I mentioned in the southeast of Turkey that the Turks want to develop on the Neolithic related to Gebekli Tepe, this amazing site there. Um, but why, why is it that this extremely nationalistic uh, politician and, and party wants an, an international involvement uh, in, in the Neolithic of Southeast Turkey. And one, one idea is that's been suggested to me again is that it's you know, clearly pre-Greek, pre-Greek and Roman. And it, it is, you know, there's no question that it's not Turkish. And, and so it allows people to say that, you know, Turkey is the origin of civilization because, because Gobekli and these sites are you know, so very, very early and they're so amazing. And, and um, so it's, it's, you know, and 
just a final thing, James, is, is that the genetic shows that in, in fact, um, you know, large, large parts of the Turkish population are indigenous. I mean, they, 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 they've been there, you know, since Çatalhöyük and earlier. That was a fact I was aware of uh, as, uh, in the background that in some ways, it's, it, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Because in some ways, cultures are transmitted by a certain immigration of a certain group of people yes. that then assume yes. obviously the native people who are then, you know, become part of the of, of, of the, the peoples that are there and, and, and obviously people breed and, and, and marry and all the rest of it. And, and the, the genetic pool is then incorporated within that. And that probably is not yes. terribly surprising. And maybe that's a challenge to some archaeological ideas of waves of invaders coming, exterminating everybody and, and, and starting afresh. That may not perhaps normally be the case. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, it seems that we wouldn't have much time for many more questions. So very quickly, the last one I would like to ask is uh, what kind of... Uh, research are you focusing on right now or is there any well is there any <laughs> um well um i I'm, tr I'm trying to concentrate on um we're still publishing chatelhuyuk and so um i think we're on the 15th and 16th volumes or something like that so we're 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 we're, we're focusing on that and then in my own research, I'm uh, trying to develop the ideas about entanglement that I've been working on for some time, but in a new direction and trying try to think about um, uh, things in terms of flows of things. And so um, that, that's where my theoretical interests are at the moment. But I, but I am very interested in uh, these, these issues that I talked about today. I think that, and so I might write, try and write about it. I'm particularly interested in you know whether whether we should stop using the word prehistory and and um, I mean it's, it's it's so taken for granted in Europe, um, but coming at it from uh, from America, I, I I do wonder whether that's something that we so so I'm very interested in in, in pushing these sorts of the issues a bit farther and seeing where 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 we end up. Right. Um, thank you very much for your responses. Thank you very much for this whole talk and, and accepting our invitation. Uh, yeah, uh, I hope your transition to new university will, will go smoothly. And hopefully uh, sometime next time you will be giving us talk in person when the times will be, again, a bit more normal or something. Yes, that would be nice. <laughs> It'd be nice to meet you all in person. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I've enjoyed the discussion very much. Yeah, we, we, we did as well. And thank you everyone else for coming. Hopefully we will see each other uh, next week during the talk that Brian Fagan will be giving us. All right. Have a nice rest of the evening. Goodbye. Thanks very much. <laughs>